Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new International Virtual Research Seminar in Finance, partnership with the Financial Management Association. My name is Henrique, and I'm happy to represent the Finance Department of FTV IS from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and also all my colleagues from the 11 universities that are part of our consortium uh, in Europe, Australia, and South America. Today, I have the pleasure to host Professor Heitor Almeida. Professor Almeida is a Stanley and Golder Chair in Corporate Finance at the G's College, College of Business, University of Illinois. He is also a co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Corporate Finance, and he is consistently publishing in basically all top journals in finance. Uh, before we start, I'd like to invite you to post your questions in the Q&A button. We will do our best to use the final minute of our seminar to entertain some questions. So without further delay, delay I would like to welcome you, Professor Omeida. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And the floor mm. is yours. Okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, can, can, you have, can you hear me? Does it sound good? Okay. Yes. And I assume you can see the screen, right? Okay. So uh, I'm uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Of course, it's, I'm happy to be here. I apologize for the previous day that I couldn't do it. Uh, so this paper is co-authored with Daniel Carvalho uh, and Tae Hyun Kim. You see the affiliations there. And it's a paper about uh, the, the working capital credit multiplier. That's the title of the paper. So the uh, general topic of this uh, uh, of of this 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 research is uh, uh, has to do with this 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 old idea in finance and economics that has motivated a lot of my research actually, which is the uh, the idea that financing frictions amplify and propagate the effect of economic and and other financial shocks. So, for example, there is the the seminal research by Bernanke and Gertler. Yotaki and Boer, right? So this is a well-known idea. There is some evidence out there. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the, in most of the empirical evidence about the financial accelerator, the credit multiplier folks is on long-term investments. So for example, there is evidence that uh, leverage amplifies the effect of financial crisis. So the, just to give a specific example here, the Giroux and Buller paper in the QJE, shows that uh, highly levered firms reduced employment more than other firms following the, the financial crisis. So that's the kind of paper that are out there. There are some other examples using different identification strategies, different experiments. Uh, so there is some evidence for the financial accelerator when we look at long-term investment. So what, what, what this paper is about is to try to test whether financial accelerator effects also matter for short-term investment. So that's our research question up there, okay? Do funding frictions also matter for short-term investments in working capital? So why is this important? Uh, there is a literature, a theoretical kind of calibration literature in macrofinance that shows that uh, introducing frictions in working capital investment helps uh, models, you know, match moments. So uh, for example, uh, if firms are, uh, I guess the most important idea is that if working capital investments are constrained, then what happens is that firms have to scale down immediately. So for example, if, uh, if a company cannot finance its inventory purchase, right? If you don't have inventory, you can't sell. Okay? So this has immediate effects on sales. And it, it kind of creates immediate uh, amplification effects of, uh, for example, financial shock. So this, this literature has argued that introducing working capital friction helps uh, understand the effect of economic shock. Okay? Uh, however, there is no empirical evidence, right? So there is this suggestion, but there is no, as far as we know, there is no clear empirical evidence in the literature. Uh, testing whether working capital investments are in fact constrained and whether there is a work and, and whether there is in fact a credit multiplier or not, okay? And uh, it's not obvious, right? Because uh, it's the, the third bullet point there. Working capital investments, when you think of it, in, 
in, in principle, they should be easier to finance, right? So these are short-term investments, for example, if you have, uh, I mean, I guess the, uh, the, the leading examples would be inventory and, and receivables. So, you know, let's think about receivables, right? So if you have receivables, uh, it should be pretty easy for firms to raise finance using receivables as collateral, right? So uh, in principle, my intuition, at least, even though like some people disagree with this, I've had uh, people uh, uh, in seminars where I gave this paper actually arguing that inventory, for example, is, is not good collateral. But anyway, so my intuition is that working capital investment should be easier to finance. So if we should be less likely to, I, to detect the uh, you know, credit multiplier effects when looking at short-term investment. So really what this paper is about is trying to develop uh, an identification strategy to allow us to test whether financial constraints also matter for working capital investments. And what the paper shows is that there is some evidence that the funding frictions do matter. Okay, so uh, we're going to show, I'm going to show you here new uh, micro level evidence that funding frictions are going to affect uh, short term investments in working capital and that are going to reduce production capacity. Uh, not for all firms, uh, the effects are going to be concentrated in certain companies. So we have a sample of public companies and, uh, in the US. Uh, in that sample, our effects are concentrated in small firms, so relatively small firms in the bottom tercile that rely on suppliers for short-term funding. So essentially, companies that uh, finance inventory and receivables, for example, by relying on payable, okay? So uh, our strategy uh, is going, I mean, our paper is going to show that uh, working capital investment is constrained and that there, there will be a propagation of shock. So there is a credit multiplier, that um, meaningful credit multiplier that amplifies the effect of shocks today and also propagates shocks over time. Okay, so this is our contribution. And most of the work in the presentation when I present this paper is to explain the identification strategy. So you might be thinking about uh, traditional differencing differences, for example, like you know, the standard uh, uh, literature on long-term long investment, right? So that uses an aggregate shock and a proxy for constraints. Uh, for example, the Giroux and Muller paper, uh, the aggregate shock is a financial crisis, and then there is a, the proxy for constraints is leverage. Okay, and then you do a, you, you do like some sort of difference in difference or related test, and uh, that that's how you identify the financial accelerator. Uh, what we're going to do in this paper is we, we're going to develop a novel identification strategy that we believe can isolate the working capital multiplier. So. As I said, really, most of my presentation presentation is going to focus on explaining this identification strategy, which we think you know it's, it's exciting because it's a new strategy that people haven't used before. Uh, and uh, the uh, key idea of this strategy is that it's going to exploit seasonality in cash flow. Okay, so I'll explain that. What I like to do is actually it's it's not very straightforward to just explain the the strategy directly. So. What I like to do when I present this paper is to start with the theory. So we have a theoretical model in the paper that helped us think about this question. And in the current draft, we have a sketch of the theory in the, in the draft, and then we have like a more complete model in the appendix. So what I'm going to try to show you is uh, how does seasonality interact with uh, working capital investment. So to, to derive some, some, some predictions and then, and then I can show you how we identify, you know, how we uh, uh, you, uh, take that to the data and then show you some results. Okay, so I'm probably not gonna have time to talk about the robustness yet. So uh, just go, going, going on here with the, the theory, our theory is an extension of Kiyotaki and Moore. Mostly Kiyotaki and Moore, there are some elements of Bernanke and Goethe as well, but it's essentially a Kiyotaki and Moore type model where, uh, we're, we're going to focus on short-term investments. So uh, we're actually going to fix the long-term. So, you know, capital expenditures, whatever sort of long-term assets that the firm needs are not are fixed, okay? At least in the basic model. And then 
uh, what the firm is going to do is to choose uh, 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 is is to, to 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 buy an input. Okay, so the, the company has to buy an, an an input up front in order to to make the sale. So you can think of inventory, for example. And then, of course, you need to finance the inventory. You could finance the inventory with cash flow or cash, right? If you don't have the cash, then you need to borrow in order to finance the inventory. And in particular, in our model, uh, we are going to, uh, to assume that this inventory is financed by supplier, okay? So uh, essentially, suppliers are going to finance a share of the input cost on credit. And then this is going to be repaid after the cash is collected. There is some evidence in the literature that uh, working capital funding is, in fact, typically provided by suppliers. It's not necessarily the only way to fund. In fact, uh, when we uh, go to the empirical work, we're going to look at different uh, uh, companies uh, and the different ways to finance working capital. And then, as I said before, we're going to show that the effects are concentrated on companies that rely on payables for, for short-term financing. So, just to sketch the, the, uh, the, the, the basic arguments of the theory here. So we are going to consider a constraint form. So we're going to assume that the, that the, that the company is constrained and then derive implications and see whether we can find those in the data. So uh, if our uh, company is constrained, then essentially you're going to be uh, buying as much input as you can every period. So PM here, in the in the slide is the, uh, the 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 cost of the input P is the price M is the amount of input. So essentially, what this company is is doing is using all of its network that's W plus the amount that you can borrow in order to buy input. Okay, so you are constrained. There is sort of an optimal level, but you can't get there. Okay, so you just exhaust your 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 uh, funds by by uh, buying input and. Uh, this function BT, the amount that you can borrow, it depends on the on 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 input. So, for example, if you have more inventory, you can you can borrow more because the inventory generates cash flow. So, an increase in input allows the firm to raise more credit. Okay, so B B prime is positive. Uh, just to give you an example of the the basic effect here, so let's say that the fun, the function B is thirty percent. So. Uh, companies can finance 30% of the input cost on, on credit, okay? Then if we solve that budget constraint, uh, uh, so, you know, this is the equation here, right? So, for example, now if we look at a shock, if there is a, one, a shock of $1 to wealth, let's say that uh, our constraint firm uh, gets a negative shock to wealth of $1, okay? Uh, that means you, you, you can... You can uh, basically buy less input, right? Because you are constrained. But then because you can buy less input, you also can, you know, you're, you're also going to be able to finance less, right? So there is this amplification effect because the amount of uh, that, that you can borrow depends on, 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 on your inventory, for example, right? So what's going to happen is the shock of $1 is going to lead to a change in short-term investment of, in, in this case, if it's 30%, the, the, that you can finance, the change is 1.43, okay? So there is an amplification effect if the constraint is buying. So this is kind of straightforward. Uh, there are other papers, you know, this was in Kiyotake Moore, for example, etc. okay? So then what we do is we introduce seasonality. Uh, that is a very nice asset pricing paper that we follow to write this. It's a paper by Chang et al. that uh, shows that uh, companies in the U.S. have strong seasonal patterns in cash flow. So uh, there are certain quarters where your profits are higher. Okay, so the um, in our model we're going to have two periods. There is a high period and a low period. Okay, so essentially what happens is our company is going to produce more output in the high period. So you can think about the production function. There is a parameter a, right, uh, that multiplies the the the, the uh, uh, production function. Remember that everything is fixed other than input. Okay. So a, if AH is greater than AL, so essentially in the high period, the company is more profitable. You're producing more output for the same input, okay? And then uh, the key condition that we're going to use in our paper is that uh, you remember that the funding, right? The, the fraction of the input cost that, is, that can be funded. So this fraction is going to be larger in the high period, okay? So if you are in your high profitability period, you can finance more 
And for example, let's say that uh, in your high period, you can fund 35% of the input cost on credit. Okay? So what's going to happen is that it, the, that same shock of $1 that I talked about before, if it happens in the high period, it's going to create a greater amplification effect. Okay, so you can do the math here. Uh, a shock of $1 in the high period creates an amplification effect of, I mean, uh, creates an additional effect of 0 0.56 instead of 0 0.43, okay? So that's gonna be one of the, the key intuitions. In the high period, when your profits are high, the company can borrow more. So if you are constrained, if the constraint is binding, then uh, a shock is going to have a, a stronger effect, okay? Uh, we talk about, in the paper, we talk about the micro foundation. So why does the borrowing limit go up in the main period? Uh, very simply here, that's basically cash flow based lending, right? So yeah, companies can play, you know, your, uh, the uh, uh, short term financing depends not only on collateral, but also depends on cash flow. So in your high period, the company can produce more cash flow. So that means you can borrow more. So for example, there is a, a recent paper by Leon and Ma showing that uh, cash flow based lending is important. Uh, Peterson and Rajan also talked, uh, there is some related evidence in the uh, older paper of Peterson and Rajan as well. So essentially you can think of this as cash flow based lending. So in the high period, you can borrow more, uh, that creates the amplification effect, okay? And then there's gonna be propagation as well. So we have a dynamic, our, our, our model is, uh, uh, it's a simple model, but it's dynamic. And what's going to happen is that uh, remember, the constraint is binding, so the amount of input that you can buy depends on your wealth, but wealth depends on how much you produce. So uh, wealth next period is going to essentially depend on the, the input, right? The YT, that's the input that you produce at this period, minus the amount that you borrow, okay? So there is a parameter here. It's the same thing as Kiyotaki and Moore. You have to force the firm to pay dividends to have a constraint steady state, but that's not very important. Uh, I can just uh, talk more about this at the end if people want. But so essentially, the, the intuition here is the standard propagation effect. So if there is a negative shock today, right, that forces the company to scale down, your output is lower. That's going to cause your wealth next year to be lower, and it's going to propagate the shock over time. Okay. Uh, so the other key intuition here, remember, everything is about seasonality. So the other key intuition that you need to understand is how does propagation interact with seasonality. So let me try to explain that now. Okay. So now let's consider a shock to prices. So that's actually going to be uh, the uh, uh, closer to our empirical framework. If you go back to that uh, borrowing constraint, uh, let me actually go back a bit here to show you. So you see that P and W are uh, actually here. Uh, P and W are basically symmetric. Okay. So a shock to, to, to prices and a shock to, to wealth essentially have the same effect. So, uh, uh, so here, what I'm thinking about is a persistent shock to prices. So that's going to be kind of equivalent to a shock to wealth in the model. Okay, uh, you know, you, for example, if your input price is more expensive, then for the same wealth, you're going to be able to to buy less. Okay, very simple. Uh, so let's say that the shock starts in period T, right? So there is this period T. You know, let's say the first quarter of 2015. Okay. So in, in period T, there's going to be different firms. There's going to be a firm that is in the high period, right? And then there is going to be a firm that is in the low period in that quarter or in that semester, okay? For the firm in the high period, there is a bigger amplification effect. That's the previous intuition, right? So if the shock happens during the high period, uh, there is a bigger, a stronger change in, uh, in uh, you know, there's this stronger amplification effect, 0.56, and the uh, firm that is in the low period is going to, uh, is, 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 it, uh, there, there is going to be a smaller amplification effect for, for that firm, okay? So that's the, you know, the immediate effect is stronger for our firm age. That was the previous intuition. But then uh, we also model like what happens next period, okay? So how do firm age compares with firm L as we go uh, to future period? So let's say we go to next period, right? Next period T plus one, uh, firm age becomes firm L, right? Because you are in the high period today, tomorrow you go to the low period. So the immediate change for firm age L is lower, right? 
But, and then, you know, if you look at here, firm LH is the opposite, right? So firm LH now has the opposite effect. So it's going to be a bigger change for firm LH. However, there is the, the propagation effect, right? So that's going to be important here. Firm HL is the, comp, is the firm that, uh, that had the initially stronger amplification effect, right? In period T, this, 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 this firm was uh, maybe E increasing output by a, by a higher amount because it was 1.56 in period T, where form LH starts from a smaller effect, okay? So what's going to happen is because of the wealth effect, right, the company that was initially hit in the high period is going to show stronger effects in the future, right? This, this shock is going to propagate over time and the propagation is stronger if the for form H, HL than for form LH. Okay, so that is the other key intuition that we use to identify the working capital multiplier. Essentially, firm L HL could see stronger, sorry, I moved wrong. So the propagation can lead to a stronger response in both periods, not only today, but also in the future. Okay, so really what we're talking about here is this idea that the timing of the shock matters because of seasonality. Uh, it really matters, you know, when, the shock to input prices have. Okay, so we discussed in the paper, you know, there is some conditions under which this propagation effect is stronger. That has to do with Bernanke and Gertler also, but you know, I think I'm actually also going to skip that. Okay, so I hope it's, uh, it's going to be more clear now when I talk about the empirical implications. So essentially, uh, what our model is showing is that the timing of a shock to input prices matters. Okay, if financial constraint binds, then what's going to happen is firms that happen to be in the main quarter when the shock hits are going to show stronger responses today, but they are also going to show stronger responses over time next period if the net worth effect is important. Okay, so what we're going to do in the data is we're going to try to isolate the working capital multiplier by testing both predictions, both the stronger uh, 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 effect today and also the amplification effect. Okay, and uh, we discussed this more in detail. I'm not going to have time to talk about all the details about alternative explanations, et cetera, but uh, the, uh, the bottom line is this, this propagation effect really helps us identify the multiplier because you might think, you know, there may be other explanations for why you respond more strongly to a shock when you are in your main quarter. You know, that's your main quarter, you're more profitable, et cetera. So, uh, there, uh, it's, it's easy, you know, for example, depending on the shape of the production function, we can generate the stronger effect today uh, without credit constraints. But uh, if there is propagate, you know, if there is a stronger effect also next period, also in the future, then this must indicate that there is some kind of propagation effect. Okay. So uh, we discussed in the paper, there may be other mechanisms uh, that could generate propagation. Uh, for example, maybe you can lose some workers if the if the negative shock is strong enough, et cetera. But what, and so what we do in the paper is we're we also refine the approach by using multiple contrasts. So that's going to be kind of closer to the standard literature, you know, looking at different types of companies. So as I mentioned before, uh, we have evidence that our mechanism is only relevant for companies that rely on payables. So that's going to be one of our contrasts. We're also going to contrast short and long-term investment. And then we're going to look at different types of shocks. I'm not sure how much time I'm going to have to show you all the evidence, but uh, I'll do what I can here. So essentially, the point is these multiple contrasts are going to allow us to separate our you know, financial constraint story from other potential uh, explanations for the uh, propagation, you know, for, for, for the amplification and the propagation effect that we detect in the data for companies that rely on pay. Okay. Uh, the, uh, so our identification strategy has a very cool feature. So I, I want to emphasize this to make sure you understand because we are using the timing of the shock, essentially you have random assignment. Okay. So, uh, right. Uh, I, I was explaining this way before. So that the, our treated firm is going to be the, the firm that was in the high period when the shock started, right? So it's age, age, L, et cetera, right? But if you think about it, there is nothing special about firm age. You know, the, the shock could have started in the, in the 
in the in the in next period, right? And then firm age would be firm L. In fact, uh, as you if you think about this, it's almost like you can control for firm level uh, un, unobservable heterogeneity that varies over time because you can compare the same company over time and just look at uh, shocks that start in the high period versus shocks that start in the low period. Okay, and to do that. Uh, a very important feature of the empirical work is we need to have recurring shocks. So our strategy doesn't work for a financial crisis, for example. You have to have shocks that are recurring. So that's why in the in the body of the paper, what we do is we use changes in oil prices. So uh, oil prices change, uh, you know, they could change in the first quarter of 2015, but then they could change later in the second quarter of 2018. So if they if the shock happens in the first quarter of 2015, some companies are going to be treated. If the shock happens later in the third quarter of 2018, then the treated comp company is going to go to the control group. Okay? So we have this random assignment. And in the paper, uh, we have evidence. So if you look at summary statistics, for example, of companies that are hit inside or outside of the main quarter, they basically they look exactly the same. Okay? So uh, season, this interaction of seasonality with recurring shock generates what looks like random assignment. So it's a very cool feature for empirical work. Okay, so there is a, a you know so the identification assumption for our uh, strategy is, is fairly weak. We think so uh, you would have to have a mechanism that. Uh, generate similar propagation and amplification effects that are only present for certain uh, uh, forms that rely on supply financing. That uh, and that, that uh, uh, you know we have the other cuts as well that I mentioned. Okay, so let me show you some data here uh, in the in the last. I have about fifteen minutes. So I think that should be uh, right fifteen twenty minutes here. So uh, our paper actually uses CompuStat. So. <laughs> I'm very proud of this because you don't you, you don't see uh, you know like corporate finance papers using CompuStat anymore. So my interpretation is you have to be very creative <laughs> to to write a CompuStat paper these days. So you know we are very proud that we are this is actually a CompuStat paper. You probably haven't seen one in a long time. So we uh, exclude uh, you know there's some standard filters. Uh, most important here is we exclude firms that. Uh, that are large, at least from the base test, because there is some evidence in the trade credit literature that these this firms use payables for other reasons. So, uh, you know, they're using payables for quality control, for example. So uh, it wouldn't help to include those in the, in the data. Uh, our, our, our definition of short-term investment, as I've been uh, mentioning before, it's essentially receivables plus inventory. So we kind of aggregate both receivables and so our sample ends in 2015. Uh, that's just for historical reasons. We've been working this paper for a while. There is no reason we couldn't update this. Okay. So the uh, uh, just to show you some basic cuts here. Uh, these are some some stats of the paper. So our one of the key variables is going to be the supplier financing, right? So there are some companies that rely more strongly on suppliers. So you can see here that. Uh, if you divide payables by sales, for example, these companies are in fact relying much more heavily on payables to finance uh, 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 investments than than the uh, or than than the average firm. Okay, so these we're gonna call these top supplier financing firms. That's gonna be where our effects are going to be most important. Okay, so then what the paper has it it has a bunch of uh, diagnostic tests that kind of validate our identification strategy. Uh, for example, uh, table two in the paper, we are looking at whether seasonality does predict cash flow. So there was some evidence already in the asset pricing paper, but uh, it's good to, to, to check it again. So essentially what this table is showing is that uh, season, uh, in, uh, in, in um, companies in the main quarter are in fact uh, more profitable and the effect is significant. All the, uh, all the coefficients are scaled here. So essentially what the coefficient means is your uh, profitability is 80% higher in the, main, if the, uh, in the main quarter than outside of the main quarter, okay? Relative to, uh, you know, to a standard deviation. So uh, the, uh, uh, if, if you remember the theory, uh, 
right? Uh, one of the key conditions, uh, I, it was an assumption in the theory, right? That is backed by micro evidence. This is the empirical evidence. So the, uh, uh, right, we assumed that uh, companies borrow more in the main quarter, right? So there is this leverage effect. So you're borrowing more during the main quarter. So this is what this table is testing, the panel B of table two. So essentially what you have here is a measure of short-term leverage is a percentage change in accounts payable uh, minus percent uh, is a sort of a percentage change in short-term leverage. You can think of short-term leverage as accounts payable divided by short-term assets. We also scale by sales. So uh, if you look at companies that do rely on payables for financing, what this table is showing is that uh, leverage is uh, 1.5, 1.4, 1.6% higher in the main quarter than outside of the main quarter. So there is some evidence that companies are in fact borrowing more uh, during the main quarter than outside of the main quarter if they are in the top supplier finance. Okay. Like I said, we are going to focus on recurring shocks. I, I hope I explained well the intuition for, for, for why this is important, right? Because we have to have this random assignment, the shocks that happen at different periods. And uh, for the for the, the, the theory, uh, and I'm not sure how much time I'm going to have to talk about this, but uh, it's also important to focus on shocks that directly affect production costs. Okay, that's because uh, shocks that affect production costs are going to be symmetric to wealth shocks. If the shock just affects demand, for example, then uh, then the effects are muted. Okay. So that's the reason why we focus on oil prices. Uh, oil price shocks are nice because they are recurring, unpredictable, and they have direct effect on uh, uh, production costs. So uh, in the paper, instead of just looking at aggregate shocks, we construct a measure of an industry oil price shock. So the idea is that different industries, different companies have different exposure to oil prices. So you know, the most basic example is to think of a, a company that produces oil. So in that case, it's not even a negative shock, right? If the oil price goes up, this is a positive shock. So what we do is we multiply the aggregate variable, you know, the oil price growth, growth by a measure of oil exposure, which is the essentially is an industry data, okay? So we're going to construct these shocks at the industry level. And, uh, and uh, uh, so this is essentially to capture the idea that different industries are going to have different exposure to oil price shock. So you can think of this as a, as an industry shock that is driven by oil price, okay? And like I said, uh, demand shocks should have uh, muted effects, so that's why we focus on uh, 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 oil. That's another reason why we focus on oil price, okay? So uh, I was mentioning before, our, our strategy generates random assignments, so this is a way of testing it, uh, right? So now we, uh, we have the oil shock, so we can look at, uh, the interaction of the oil shock with seasonality. So what this table is doing is comparing firms that are hit by shocks inside and outside of the main quarter. And you have some basic characteristics here, size, age, Q, and cash flow. And you can see that if you look at the, I mean, it looks identical, right? Uh, it's not even, you know, it's obviously statistically the same, but even if you look at the numbers, it looks like it's the same sample. Okay, so like I said, I think this is a very cool feature of the uh, of the strategy that it generates this random assignment uh, uh, across. You know, so it it there there is nothing special about an oil price shock that that happens in the first quarter of 2015 versus a shock that happens in the second quarter of 2017. So you know, essentially, treat and control firms are the same. Okay. So there is some issue with hedging here. Essentially, we assume that there is no hedging. I can talk more about that later. Uh, there is a, an excuse based on literature that constraint firms do not fully hedge. I mean, you might be thinking that uh, if, there if oil price changes matter, then firms should be hedging it. But uh, very short, our story is that these are firms that are relatively constrained, so they may not be able to hedge this short. Okay? Uh, and then uh, we're actually going to aggregate the, uh, uh, the, the periods, instead of looking at quarters in the main empirical analysis, we're going to aggregate, uh, we're going to look at semesters. That's because our evidence suggests that seasonality actually affects cash flows, not only this quarter, but also the next one, maybe because of a measurement issue. So where you can think of the current period as the first semester, and then the next period is the second semester, okay? Uh, 
And so the essentially the equation that we estimate is here in this slide. So we have uh, uh, changes in outcomes in the left hand side, for example, sales, short term investments, etc. And the, the, the key coefficient is this beta one, which is the interaction of the industry shock. So this industry shock that is driven by oil prices with the main quarter. So essentially what this coefficient is going to capture is if there is a difference in the, uh, in the effect of a shock that happens in the main quarter versus a shock that happens outside of the main quarter. There are some basic controls, fixed effects, etc. And the immediate effect is going to be captured in the current semester, in the first semester. And then the propagation effect is going to be captured by defining the outcome in the next semester. Okay, so for example, sales. We're going to look at changes in sales in the same semester and then changes in sales in the next semester for companies that are in the main quarter in, at time T in the first semester, okay? And so this is the main table with the main result. Uh, so this table is basically going to show that there is there are very significant effects on sales for companies in the top supplier financing, okay? So here, for example, the, this, this interaction is, uh, as I said before, all the coefficients are scaled so you can think of this as the impact of a typical change in oil prices for a company with the median industry beta. Okay? If the shock happens in the main quarter, it's going to have, and the outcome is the change in logs, so it's sort of a percentage change. So if a shock happens in the main quarter, it's going to have an immediate effect on sales that is 2% higher than uh, shocks that happen outside of the main quarter. Okay, so the timing of the shock creates a 2% additional change in sales. So, for example, if oil prices are going down, a typical uh, 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 decrease in oil prices is going to increase sales by 2% more if it happens in the main quarter versus outside of the main quarter. And then, importantly, we also observe the amplification, of the propagation effect. So, if we look at the next semester, uh, companies that were in the main quarter in the previous semester continue to see a, a stronger effect. So the effect of the shock is 2.4% more for, for companies that were in the main quarter in the first semester than for other firms, okay? So this is the clear evidence that there is this propagation effect for companies that are in the top supplier financing group. And there really isn't anything in the other. So it really only for companies that have that, that, uh, that are borrowing more in the main quarter, those are the companies where you observe this. Okay, uh, the, so this is the main, uh, then there's uh, uh, several, of course, you know, there's several other tables in the paper. For example, we do kind of a test to show that the coefficients are statistically different. Then we look at short-term investments, right? So the mechanism is driven by short-term investments. So we show that short-term investments are also changing more when the shock happens in the main quarter and there is an amplification effect, okay? Uh, we, uh, a sort of a very important part of the paper that I'm not going to have time to talk about in detail is we, we compare changes in, we compare working capital to capital expenditure. And the key intuition is that we should not observe seasonality for long-term investment, right? Because uh, cash flows also matter for long-term investment, but it's cash flows that happen over a long time period. So the fact that your cash flow is higher today it really shouldn't affect, uh, you know, your funding constraint on capital expenditure. So these temporary differences do not affect borrowing term for long-term investment. So what we find is we don't, we basically don't find any effect. Let me just show you this. There is no effect for long-term investment. You really have to look at working capital in order to, to observe these short-term amplification effects. Okay. Uh, then there is a bunch of other tests. Uh, we look at uh, payables as well. We at demand shocks, uh, we look at other companies that don't rely on supply financing, but rely, for example, on credit lines to fund uh, uh, working capital investments. We show that for these firms, we don't observe leverage seasonality, and then we also don't, don't have any, any sales and working capital amplification effect. Then we do a bunch of placebo tests. For example, I mentioned in the beginning, some companies could just be funding inventory by, uh, you know, with cash. You have enough cash, you don't have to borrow. So cash-rich firms don't, uh, you know, there is no leverage effect, there is no amplification, there is no propagation effect. 
we look at large forms. If a form is, is large, then you should be relatively unconstrained. There is no, again, there is no leverage effect. There is no amplification effect. There is no propagation. Okay? So you can check the paper. There is a bunch of different uh, validation tests there. Uh, essentially, what we find is uh, to just to put numbers on the message in the beginning, there is a 1.5% to 3%, depending on the specification, a stronger response of both short term investment and sales to oil shocks that initiating the main quarter, right? So, really, the timing of the shock is what is causing it. Okay? And we think that the collection of the evidence su does suggest that companies are facing binding constraints on the ability to finance working capital. So we find it, it it's hard to explain these, you know, these propagation amplification effects with other mechanisms. You know, as we discuss in the paper, we kind of try to test some, some of these other stories, but essentially we believe that this is the evidence, right, that I was talking about in the beginning. This is the evidence that shows that uh, uh, working capital is constrained for certain companies and that there is a meaningful credit multiplier that operates through working capital as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, you might be uh, worrying about uh, uh, external validity, right? So we are focusing on a subset of companies. Uh, that's where the constraint seems to matter. Uh, this fraction is significant. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a 27 to 30 percent cent of sales. And then you might think that our mechanism might be relevant in other contexts as well. For example, private firms are not in the sample. There is some evidence in corporate finance suggesting that private firms are more constrained than, uh, than public firms. So uh, this, this mechanism might matter for, for private firms as well. And, uh, and then, you know, there's a... We, uh, we, we, we kind of focus on these interactions to identify the working capital, but uh, the working capital multiply, but they may also matter for shocks that happen outside. For example, if a shock happens outside of the main quarter, we are not saying that there is no multiplier, right? But we are using that as a control group. So that's the baseline. Then we're only looking at the difference when the shock happens in the main quarter. So we maybe underestimate the effect of the shock by, uh, you know, by the nature of the identification strategy. Okay, so we believe that this is the first microempirical evidence that there is a working capital credit multiplier, you know, that we know of. Uh, I should have said in the beginning, I think the only other evidence that we had are sort of uh, some old papers that uh, use uh, kind of an investment cash flow sensitivity, you know, back in the, in the 90s, people kind of did the Fazari, Hubbard, and Peterson regression for inventory, you know, so there is stuff like that which I don't think would be credible anymore. You know, it wouldn't be publishable even in the Journal of Corporate Finance, right? So uh, you think this is the first like solid microempirical evidence that we have that uh, working capital is constrained and it can create uh, multiplier effects. Uh, I hope you understood at least the basic idea that there is this new strategy that uses the timing of the shock because there is cash flow seasonality, we can use the timing of the shock to, to identify the multiplier. So essentially, this is kind of uh, using, it's showing that initial conditions matter, right? So uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 a company's condition when the shock happens is actually going to matter for not only the immediate effect, but also the, the future effects of the shock, okay? So in terms of future research, uh, we, uh, we, are, we are still you know, trying to publish this paper. So the paper is under revision, but once we uh, once we manage to publish it, so I think our next steps would be with, we we want to try to connect this better to that macro finance literature that I mentioned in the beginning. That is sort of our initial motivation to do this, uh, and we want to see if uh, our empirical estimates can help uh, calibrate and kind of uh, you know uh, give some guidance to to the people doing macro finance. Uh, and then we all, we want to talk a little bit more about we want to think a little bit deeper about supplier financing as well, right? So why are companies relying so heavily on payables if it creates these uh, this additional risk, right? That shocks are going to have this amplification effect, etc. So we want to think a bit more about that. But uh, that's what I had. I think uh, about forty five minutes, right? Did I do a good job with time? <laughs>
Yes, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, congratulations on your paper. Very creative and nicely uh, done in pre code design and identification strategy. It kind of gives us hope to have again a 100% computer based uh, a paper in the future. Yep. So uh, if, if anyone has some questions, uh, please uh, type in the Q&A uh, uh, button. We do have some questions already here. So the first one is, are the shocks randomly assigned to time? Can you elaborate on shocks lasting more than one, one yeah. factor? Does that matter? Yeah, they're basically yes, because uh, oil price changes are unpredictable. So oil prices can change anytime. I mean, you don't know when it's gonna happen. So, uh, and, Really, that's the reason. And then, of course, the other important condition is uh, that firms have different main quarters, right? So there is a, 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 a company that has the main quarter in, in, let's say, the first semester, and then another company that has its main quarter in the second semester. So if the shock happens in the first semester, the fir company one is in the treated group. If the shock happens in the second semester, then company one is in the control group. So that's what generates the, the random assignment. And what about shocks lasting more than one quarter? Is that a... Is well, that yeah, a it's actually important. So our framework works for both, okay? But we, mm -hmm. the implications are especially nice for persistent shocks. And I, we think oil price shocks is, a, is an example because if the oil price changes today, that doesn't mean that it's going to go back down next semester. That's probably a persistent change, Okay. So remember, you know, how I was explaining the propagation effect. If there is a persistent change in oil price, right? So when we go to the next period, the treated firm becomes controlled. So, you know, the effect should be weaker for the firm that was in the main quarter today because now, you know, the other firm has moved into the treated group. But that's what the only reason then in the theory, the only reason to observe a stronger change for for firm one, next period is because of the propagation, right? Because of the endogenous change in wealth. So, you know, having uh, having persistent shocks gives us a way of isolating the propagation effect. If if the shock is not persistent, then basically what's going to happen is we're only going to have a, we're 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 going to have a. a amplification effect today and then there's going to be propagation but then it's kind of obvious right that the effect is going to be stronger for firm one than firm two because firm two doesn't have a counter effect you know a counter shock next period so we think the implications are especially nice for uh shocks that are that have that that there are permanent okay but in the theory we look at we actually have a parameter that uh, models the, the the persistence of the shock and we show that the results hold irrespective of how persistent the shock is. But it's important, like we don't, we don't need the shock not to be persistent. We can handle fully persistent shock, okay? Last question is, shouldn't the main quarter be similar in each industry? Uh, and can yeah. you predict anything about the second and third quarter after the shock? Yeah, so essentially uh, we show in the paper that the the main quarter variable is essentially uh, uh, explained by industry and geography. Okay, so if you run a regression geography. of the main quarter variable on the left hand side, and uh, essentially if you put industry like four digit SIC dump and geographical dumps on the right hand side, you explain everything. Okay, so it is an industry variable. However. Right. Remember that our identification strategy allows us to control for firm level and observable. So it doesn't matter that the main quarter variable is defined at the industry level. We can still look at, uh, you know, you, you know we, are, we, are, we, we are not comparing industry one to industry two. OK, you can. It's better to think of this as you are comparing the same company over time okay? because of this random assignment. Okay. So yes, it's true that the seasonality is defined in the industry level, but that doesn't really contaminate the identification strategy because of this recurrence, right? So you can think of it this way. Industry one is affected today, right? Because the shock happens in the main quarter for industry one, but then, you know, we have another shock where industry one is in the control group, okay? So that kind of gen uh, allows us to compare uh, uh, 
companies in the same industry are really like a company to itself, depending on when the shock there. Okay. Um, how, how do you define the shock itself? Uh, it's, it's only variation in the oil price changes, yeah. right? Is yeah. Yeah. So like two or three standard deviations. No. Yeah. We, yeah. Right. So we are looking at uh, we are just looking at changes in oil prices. Uh, in the to, to estimate our regression, the coefficients that you saw though are uh, they are scaled, right? As I was trying to explain this, so they are scaled to capture the effect of a typical shock. Okay, so when I said 1.5 to 3 percent, that is the effect of a one standard deviation change in oil price. Okay, okay? so it's not like a small change. So of course, you know, a uh, one standard deviation change is not going to happen all the time, <laughs> right? So the, that's what the coefficient means. But we estimate the regression looking at all the, the you know, the entire chain. Uh, we, we actually thought about uh, uh, restricting the sample, but then the, the and, and then just looking at, uh, just looking at uh, uh, bigger shocks, but that kind of, uh, you, you know, we, we didn't really see the reason to, 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 to you know, there, we didn't see any strong reason to, to do that. Uh, Unless you can think that maybe there is heterogeneity, right? So maybe a large shock to oil prices could have a stronger effect for it. Okay. A quick question: Why should why choose the oil prices shock? Uh, how about the electricity prices? Yeah, I mean, you could think of other shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, we we also in the beginning we thought of using exchange rates as well. Uh, we actually had some results in the beginning, and I actually I have uh, one of uh, one of my PhD students is actually working on a, a framework trying to see if uh, exchange rate shocks affect working capital. You know, using our our strategy. Uh, yeah, electricity. You know, that you can think of other shocks to other inputs that might also have uh, similar effects. I mean, it is important that the shocks are recurring. Like I mentioned, you know, I mean, our strategy is not going to work. If you have a one-time shock, like a banking crisis, right? You know, you have to have several banking crises, you know, in order to generate for firms to move between treatment and control. But so, as long as you have that, we can we can at least estimate the uh, the uh, you know the uh, the equations and and use the strategy. Yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, and what if the firm is building uh, operational capacity before the main partner? In yeah. order to support the operations of the main party. Right. Yeah. No. This is this is what I, I, I talked briefly about this, but uh, one one implication of our results is that this company should really be trying to to hedge, uh, you know, the impact of shocks in the main quarter because they are going to have stronger effects. So it creates additional risk. Okay. And uh, we want to do more research on this. I don't think we have a full understanding, but. Uh, what we have in the current draft is this explanation based on existing research that if these firms are very constrained, you know, I mean, if they are financially constrained, they, they may be unable to kind of build this uh, additional capacity. So, you know, in the previous quarters, they, uh, they have to, to, they face a choice. I mean, am I going to save cash to protect my future operations or am I going to spend the cash today, you know, to, to increase output? Okay, and uh, what the, the the research by Rampini and Vishwanathan suggests that constrained firms uh, essentially that some companies are too poor to hedge, even though there is a benefit of hedging. The cost of hedging is high because it requires them to scale down operations today. Okay, so that's the intuition we use, but we want to explore that further. Uh, to it's not entirely clear to us that there is sort of a one-to-one -one mapping between the Rampini and Vishwanathan framework. And this, uh, and this, this in our, our, our framework. So that's kind of something we want to think about in future research. But yeah, in the, in, in the, in the theory, we basically assume that the shock is zero probability. It's the same thing as Kiyotaki and Moore. So not only that, that the shock is unpredictable, you know, our company doesn't know that the shock will happen. Okay. That's why there is no hedge. I mean, you don't hedge against something that you think is never going to happen, right? So that, of course, simplifies the framework a lot, but it's not like, uh, this is not, uh, you know, it's not consistent with the real world, right? Of course, companies know that oil prices change, 
And the question is, what what are they going to do about it, right? So yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, the next question is, if the effect of the supplier finance is through the impact on the ability to finance working capital uses, the same effect to the cure in case of shock to other sources of short-term finance, such as the bank. Okay, let, let, let me read this one here. Yeah. yeah, it's right. here in the chat, right? Let me hear, read yeah. it. This is a long one, yes. Yeah, uh, so I agree. Uh, you should have the same effect for other shocks. So, for example, suppose there is a banking crisis, right? It's still the, true that the timing of the banking crisis will matter, right? So, the, the, if the banking crisis happens in the first semester, then companies that are in the main quarter are going to be more heavily affected. The problem is we can, you cannot use our identification strategy, right? Because you're, you're not going to be able to, to estimate, at, at, you know, at least, uh, you, uh, you, you know, you're, 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 you're not going to be able to, use, to fully use our strategy because you would, need a very, you, uh, uh, you would need a similar banking crisis happening in the second semester. <laughs> That's the problem, okay? So... The model works. I mean, if there is a shock today, it can be a financial shock. You know, it will have stronger effects for companies that are in the main quarter because of our mechanism. Just that you can't, uh, you can't estimate it empirically, at least in the way that we did. Okay? You can try, but then you know, there is going to be harder to isolate the working capital multiplier. Uh, and yeah, the hedging motive is, uh, I talked about, I mean, of course, this, this, this generates additional incentives for hedging, right? Uh, we think, especially like to hedge. Uh, 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 and there is this additional dimension. I think the other question uh, referred to this, right? Uh, you, you, you really want to worry about uh, the time, right? You know, you want to make sure you protect the operation in the main quarter. So, of course, I mean, one way to, to, to do this, the simple way to do this would be to just like buy a future, for example. So, you know, you're not subject to changes in oil prices or to any other shock, right? But uh, that uh, the question is why don't firms do it? And you know, so we want to think more about that. But uh, yeah, this is a good point. Hey everyone, we are about time. So thank you everyone for uh, your attention. Thanks again, Professor Almeida for your great seminar. Okay, thank you. And I think we are done. Thank you everyone and see you next thank time. Thank you, have a good day. Ciao. Thank you, Eto. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.